Welcome back, everyone, to the next installment of the QSI virtual seminar. I don't think we have a name for it, but let's just call it QSI virtual seminar series. Our next speaker is Adrian Chapman from the University of Sydney, and he's going to be talking about free fermion solvable spin models. Take it away, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today and talk about a little about what uh, some exciting research that I think is going on at University of Sydney. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, free fermion solvable spin models and their characterization via graph invariance. Uh, this is uh, work that I've done in collaboration with Stephen Flamia uh, at the University of Sydney. And uh, you can find our uh, paper on, on either quantum or the archive uh, here. And, and this is a, a big graph. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, let's see. Okay, great. So uh, our motivation is, well, we care about finding exact solutions to things. Um, you may care about this because, well, for one thing, it actually teaches you something interesting. Uh, you may want to, say, design uh, new topological quantum materials, uh, possibly for error correction. Um, and you may just you know, want to know about some interesting quantum properties that many body systems exhibit. Um, so we are going to be thinking about exact solutions for spin models. And one particular very interesting family of solutions is what are called mappings to free fermions. Um, so these are sort of mathematically elegant mappings um, that you can use as the starting point for perturbation theory or sort of an effective theory to describe a much more complicated system. Um, and they also have a really rich and interesting connection to complexity theory. So uh, for one thing, they are um, sort of simulated by match gate circuits, which are the uh, most general time dependent uh, free fermion Hamiltonian circuit class. Um, and so these were, you know, uh, examined in these early references, but it's sort of an ongoing, this is an ongoing field of research. Um, uh, they also have an interesting connection to what's called the FKT algorithm, the fisher castle and Temperley algorithm for calculating weighted perfect matchings of a planar graph. Um, and they've also recently been shown to have a connection to what's called the sensitivity conjecture. Uh, yeah, so there's recently a paper connecting uh, the proof of the sensitivity conjecture to a mapping from an adjacency matrix to free fermions. Um, so it'd be, you know, there's an interesting sort of connection to computer science that you wouldn't have expected there. Um, and of all of these applications, graph theory plays a central role. Um, so as I mentioned, some connections to graphs with the FKT algorithm, but there's also connections to graphs with the sensitivity conjecture and in match gate circuits. Um, so these are sort of the exact, the family of exact solutions of spin models that we're going to be looking at. Um, and so uh, before I talk about what fermions are, I'm going to talk a little bit about graphs. Um, so sort of the central object uh, of this research is uh, these graphs, which are defined in terms of Hamiltonians. So if you don't know uh, what a graph is, then uh, a graph is just a set of vertices together with a set of what are called edges, which are just pairs of, uh, distinct vertices. I won't take self loops uh, of graphs in this case. And to just give kind of an example, um, I'm going to consider a Hamiltonian, uh, which is defined on, in this case, four qubits. So it's the uh, XY chain with a local uh, Z field uh, pointed on every qubit for four qubits. And uh, I'm going to define a graph from this Hamiltonian by assigning a vertex to every term in the Hamiltonian written in the Pali basis. So um, I'm gonna call this the frustration graph. And so I'm gonna call so the frustration graph this Hamiltonian is one whose vertices are the Pali terms written in that basis. And the vertices in the graph are neighboring uh, if and only if the corresponding Pali's in the graph, uh, sorry, in the Hamiltonian anti-commute with each other. So uh, the frustration graph of this Hamiltonian is an eight vertex graph. Um, and you can see the vertices labeled. And so you can see that if vertices uh, correspond to anti-commuting pallies, they're neighboring. And so this graph has some uh, sort of resemblance to the spatial structure of the Hamiltonian I started with, uh, but it's not exactly the same. So <clears throat> this is kind of a way of capturing uh, the spatial structure of the Hamiltonian together with the uh, algebraic relationships uh, between the different terms. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is an example of a graph. And this, this thing called the frustration graph is the central object that we're going to be looking at. Um, so OK, so just to like maybe motivate this a little bit more, I want to consider what I call a discrete dynamical system. Um, so given a graph, we're going to 
assume that the, you know think about this graph as corresponding to some Hamiltonian and I want to sort of iteratively compute its Lie closure. Um, so what does that mean? I want to take nested commutators of terms in the Hamiltonian until I can't make anything new. Um, but I'm going to define this uh, dynamical process in terms of the graph only. So given the graph, um, I iterate through all the edges of the graph. And so for every edge in the graph, here's an, a highlighted edge between vertices v1 and v2e. I'm going to add a vertex whose neighbors are adjacent, sorry, whose neighbors are vertices neighboring exactly one of either v1 or v2. So I'm going to take the symmetric difference between the neighborhoods of v1 and v2, and I'm going to add a vertex which neighbors only vertices in the symmetric difference. And so this corresponds to Lie closure, because if I think of v1 and v2 as anti-commuting terms, uh, then their product has neighbors which are in the symmetric, which are the symmetric difference of the neighborhoods of v1 and v2. And then I'm also going to stipulate that I can't add a vertex if there's already a vertex with the same neighbors. Um, so if I happen to take this, uh, this uh, iterative update again, then and I add a vertex for the same neighbors as a previous vertex that I've already seen, uh, I'm not going to allow that. And so I'm just going to repeat this uh, discrete dynamical process until uh, the graph saturates and the process terminates. Um, yeah, so let's just, as a numerical sort of experiment, look at how this process behaves on two different models. So one model, the model on the left, is the model we've just seen, which is I will call solvable. And uh, this is the graph of this model. And uh, the other is uh, what I'm going to call not solvable. And I'm going to add just one extra term to this, to this model, uh, corresponding to one extra vertex in the graph. And that's the sort of integrability breaking term. Um, so I'm going to run this, this process on each of these graphs, and we're going to see what happens. So just to start with the solvable model, hopefully everybody can see the animation playing. Um, so we see that you know, it gets kind of big, but it saturates quickly after about 28 vertices. And that's what we would expect a little bit, because we know that this model has a sort of bounded size of its Lie algebra. Um, but for the not solvable case, uh, when I iterate it, well, it grows quickly, and it grows actually much larger and faster than the original uh, solvable case. And it saturates at 63 vertices, which for those curious is, is 2 to the 7 minus 1, uh, I think. Maybe it's 2 to the 6 minus 1. But anyway, so. Uh, yeah, so somehow, even though I only had one extra vertex uh, in this not solvable Hamiltonian, um, this iterative update procedure, which was defined only in terms of the graph alone, somehow knew that uh, this process would iterate to something much bigger than the, original, uh, than the original graph without that vertex added. So somehow these graphs intrinsically know whether or not they describe fermion Hamiltonians uh, or solvable Hamiltonians or not. Um, and so that's kind of starting point for thinking about these graphs as sort of like important structures uh, to describe Hamiltonians. So now I'm going to talk about what it means for a Hamiltonian to be a free fermion Hamiltonian. Um, so let's consider the solvable uh, example. And what we need to do, or the sort of a conventional solution to solve this model is to apply what's called the jordan wigner transformation. Um, and so what we do is we define uh, Majorana modes, we define for n qubits, two n Majorana modes uh, defined in terms of Pali operators. And uh, these Pali operators are non-local. So they have for the 2j, for the say jth pair of Majorana modes, uh, gamma 2j minus 1 gamma 2j, um, I have Pali's occupying spin j or site j. And uh, these Pali's have Pali x or y at the, at the site of interest. And then uh, in our convention, a string of, of Pali Zs extending all the way uh, to the left. Um, so these are not, this is a non-local mapping. Um, and you can verify, uh, maybe it's just easy to see, that uh, these uh, Majorana modes satisfy what are called the canonical anti-commutation relations. And uh, yeah, so these, these modes all mutually anti-commute with each other uh, unless they're identical, in which case they square to the identity. And so that's what this, this uh, two delta i, uh, two delta uh, mu nu i, is, uh, is capturing. So um, when we perform this uh, transformation on the Hamiltonian terms, the terms in this Hamiltonian above, um, we see that they give uh, expressions in terms of Majorana operators, which are quadratic. So uh, just as an example, if you look at gamma 10 times gamma 11, 
and you multiply their corresponding Pauli operators, uh, then you'll find that they multiply up to a phase um, to just a, even though both of them are non-local, these strings of Zs cancel everywhere. And uh, you end up with a local term, which is just one of the terms um, in the Hamiltonian, in the original Hamiltonian. So this will happen for every term in the Hamiltonian. Um, so once you do this, uh, you get a Hamiltonian described in terms of Majorana fermions, um, which is quadratic. And uh, therefore, you can write it as a bilinear form acting on a vector of operators, um, these gamma operators, which is, so this, this bold gamma is a vector of gamma operators. Um, and so since all of these Majorana modes anti-commute with each other, uh, without loss of generality, I can take the coefficient matrix H to be a anti-symmetric one. And it also must be real because the Ham uh, Hamiltonian is Hermitian. And we can also take it to be traceless because uh, if I just ignore the trace, that's just a constant energy shift on the Hamiltonian. Um, so under quadratic Hamiltonians, the Majorana operators themselves uh, transform covariantly. So if I take my Majorana operator expressed originally in terms of its Pali definition and conjugate it in the spin picture by uh, the interaction, sorry, the um, integrable Hamiltonian, uh, then this just maps the Majorana operator to a linear combination of Majorana operators whose amplitudes are given by the exponentials of the single particle Hamiltonian or the coefficient matrix uh, H here up to some factor. And um, so that greatly simplifies the uh, calculation of anything you want to compute about this Hamiltonian because um, basically it means that it's uh, uh, conjugation action on the uh, observables in the Hilbert space is, uh, is reducible. So um, yeah, so OK, so this, this, this uh, single particle transition matrix, what I, this thing called e to the minus 4h, is uh, a member of the orthogonal group. Um, it's a 2n by 2n matrix because it's generated by an anti-symmetric matrix. Um, and so as I said, we can easily find, uh, we can easily exactly solve this Hamiltonian which I mean find the spectrum and its eigenvectors by diagonalizing H itself. So explicitly what we do um, is we find a, uh, a generating Hamiltonian for an orthogonal matrix, which diagonalizes H. So because H is anti-symmetric, we can only block diagonalize it. We can't directly diagonalize it uh, via orthogonal matrices. So it block diagonalizes into this direct sum of uh, two by two blocks with these anti-symmetric Williamson eigenvalues. Um, and uh, when we embed later this uh, diagonalizing orthogonal matrix e to the four w or e to the minus four w into the spin picture, uh, sorry, these are c's, but they should be gammas. Um, the conjugation action on H uh, actually just um, diagonalizes it completely to a linear combination of Z operators. So there are no uh, sort of correlations in its eigenvalues, all of its eigenvalues are sums and differences of single particle eigenvalues, which were the Williamson eigenvalues of the original anti-symmetric um, Hamiltonian, single particle Hamiltonian. So yeah, so we recover all two to the n uh, eigenvalues of the original Hamiltonian by taking two to the n sums and differences of n single particle energies. Uh, so the Hamiltonian energies have a compressed description. And in fact, the, you can also find a compressed description of its eigenvectors as well. And so this is what it means to solve a Hamiltonian by free fermions, is I can get all of its, its uh, eigenvalues and eigenstates um, by simply reducing the problem to one which is exponentially smaller and then uh, diagonalizing a matrix on that smaller space. So right. so. Um, Let's look at another free fermion solution aside from the 1D model I described. Um, so this one's a little bit different. This is the Kataev honeycomb model. And the Kataev honeycomb model is a quantum compass model, which means that uh, it's defined on a lattice and the uh, interaction definition depends on the direction of the bonds of the lattice. So you'll see that on this picture of the honeycomb lattice that I've drawn, uh, there are three bond colors, blue, red, and green. And each of those corresponds to a different interaction type. So uh, spins joined by blue bonds interact by XX operator interaction, and uh, green is ZZ, and, and red is YY. Um, and so these are the only interactions. So everything uh, only interacts by 
uh, you know, one of the, everything only sees uh, its neighbors by one of these three interaction types, depending on which direction the neighbor is. And um, so this has an extensive set of commuting symmetries, this model does. Um, and these are bonds uh, on cycles of the lattice. So if I multiply these yellow bonds, I don't know how easy that is to see, but um, around cycles, then I'll see, uh, I'll get operators that commute with the entire Hamiltonian and in fact, every term in the Hamiltonian. So they sort of commute universally with this Hamiltonian. Um, so if I have an LX by LY lattice where LX and LY are the, the linear dimensions of the lattice, uh, the remaining effective Hilbert space after I restrict to a symmetry sector of all of the um, plaquette and uh, if it's on a torus, you can also have non-trivial non-trivial homological loops uh, winding around the handles of the torus. If I restrict to the mutual eigenspace of all of these things, um, I retain LX, LY qubits. So I retain an extensive number of sort of effective qubits even after restricting to a fixed symmetry sector. So this extensive set of commuting symmetries is not enough uh, to completely solve this Hamiltonian. And so one of the great insights of uh, Kataev uh, when solving this model is to notice that what is left over once you've done uh, this restriction onto a fixed eigenspace of the symmetries is uh, that the remaining Hamiltonian can be mapped onto a free fermion model. And so this free fermion Hamiltonian is what we do to complete the solution. So uh, this free fermion mapping happens locally, unlike the other, the, other, the jordan Wigner transformation. Um, and what we do is we map each spin, so x, y, z, uh, to four fermions, where um, to to two of four fermions, where each uh, spin sees a fixed uh, sort of shared mode between every uh, spin in that at that site, and also its own sort of unique uh, fermion. So, say sigma x is going to have uh, is going to be mapped to b x times c, and um, when we do this, we actually enlarge the Hilbert space at each spin. And so there is a resultant new symmetry at each vertex, which is the product of all four uh, Majorana modes of that vertex. And that simply enforces the constraint that the product of three pallies gives me the identity, x times y times z gives me the identity. Um, and so when we uh, express the Hamiltonian this way, we find that uh, these bond fermions, these, these B alphas, pair up and uh, give you uh, operators which commute, again, universally with the Hamiltonian. So they are new sort of symmetries that you get from this embedding as well. And so we can restrict uh, the Hamiltonian to a fixed symmetry sector of its plaquettes uh, or its, or its uh, cycles um, by restricting to a fixed symmetry sector of these bonds. So these bonds carry the information of which symmetry sector on the plaquette uh, symmetries we're restricting to. And uh, once you've restricted these bond degrees of freedom to plus or minus one, the resulting Hamiltonian that is left over is now quadratic in just the matter fermions or the C operators. And that just gives you a free fermion Hamiltonian, which you can then again solve. And so you have to go sort of iteratively solving the Hamiltonian sector by sector. Um, so, okay, so uh, before I proceed, um, just want to give a brief outline of the talk to come. So uh, I've divided the talk up into three sections, which I sort of classify in terms of three graphical structures. Um, so the first section of the talk is about clicks. Um, the, second, the second section is about cycles, which I associate to stabilizers. And the third is uh, going to be about independent sets and sort of their physical relevance. And um, just to briefly mention what each of these graphical structures is. Um, so here's a graph. It's this, uh, this big graph on the right here. And so, oh, but before I say that, um, so clicks and cycles are what uh, this paper is about. And independent sets are going to capture some ongoing work that is happening at the University of Sydney. Um, so, OK, so, so clicks, uh, if you're unfamiliar, are um, subsets of vertices or subgraphs that are complete. So a click is a graph where every vertex is neighboring to every other vertex. And so you can see a click is highlighted here in this larger graph. A cycle is maybe what you expect or what we know from the previous uh, uh, solution to the type honeycomb model. It's just a uh, graph in which every vertex has two neighbors. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it has this, what we just imagined as a cycle. And uh, an independent set, if you're not familiar with that, it's a little bit hard to see if I just highlight the vertices by themselves, is a set of mutually non-neighboring vertices uh, or the complement to a click. So um, yeah, so these are, if you think about the Hamiltonian as, uh, this is the frustration graph of a the Hamiltonian, these vertices are uh, sets of mutually commuting operators in the Hamiltonian. Um, so, okay, so uh, the, the first section that I'm going to talk about involves uh, what I think of as fermions, and so we're going to talk about clicks. Um, so the main question we wanted to address in this work is to ask when is a mapping to free fermions either via the jordan wigner transformation, the type honeycomb type solution, or some generalization thereof, where, when is that possible? Um, so suppose we're given a general Pali Hamiltonian. Um, the, what we're asking is when can we define distinct quadratic fermion operators such that the commutation relations are respected? That is, when can I find pairs of modes, gamma j sub one, gamma j sub two, um, which I map P sub j, from which I map P, P sub j, such that um, uh, Pauli's anti-commute uh, when the, the Majorana quadratics do. Uh, and so to say this in sort of graph theoretic language uh, from the frustration graph picture, um, we want to know when can we label the vertices of the frustration graph by subsets, so these, these gamma subsets, which can overlap with each other of size in most two, such that the neighboring vertices on the frustration graph have subsets that intersect at exactly one element. So Majorana fermion quadratics uh, anti-commute if they happen to uh, intersect at exactly one element, if they set of their intersection, size of the intersection set is one. Um, and so that's what we're asking for. We want to find pairs such that we can assign pairs to Pali's um, and Pali's anti-commute only if they overlap at one of the elements in the pair. And the answer to this is what are called line graphs. So uh, a line graph is a graph defined from a, a um, what's called a root graph. So if you're given a, a graph, which can be anything, a root graph R, uh, its line graph is the graph whose vertices correspond to the edges of R, and two vertices are neighboring in the line graph if the corresponding edges in R share a vertex. So just to give an example, here's just a graph. This is our root graph. And, um, the line graph mapping assigns a vertex to every edge and vertices are neighboring if the edges are incident in the original graph. And so uh, the line graph of the black graph here is this, uh, um, is this graph. And uh, you may recognize that as the sort of integrable model uh, that we looked at before, that four qubit Hamiltonian. Um, so our fundamental theorem from this paper says that there exists a free fermion description uh, of a Pali Hamiltonian uh, the way that I've defined earlier, uh, if and only if its frustration graph is a line graph. Um, so it's a necessary and sufficient condition to determine when a generator to generator free fermion solution exists uh, given a Pali Hamiltonian. Um, and so why did I say this has something to do with clicks? So another description, an equally equivalent description or equally valid description of a line graph is a graph uh, for which there exists an edge partition into clicks such that every vertex belongs to at most two clicks. So uh, here in this graph on the right, this thing which is a line graph, um, the clicks are the triangles. So uh, every vertex belongs to at most two triangles. Some vertices belong to exactly one triangle, um, but every vertex belongs to at most two triangles. So this is an edge partitioning into clicks. So this is a about a decomposition of a line graph. Um, so just to give a quick proof sketch of our fundamental theorem. Um, so this is the theorem we want to show given the Pali Hamiltonian, when can we find this mapping? Uh, so this mapping exists if and only if the, the graph is a line graph, the frustration graph is a line graph. So if the, if the mapping exists, then clearly the frustration graph is a line graph because uh, the definitions are exactly the same. So definition of a line graph is the the condition under which Pali's anti-commute if they have a free fermion description. Um, if the frustration graph is a line graph, so uh, what we want to do is associate a fermion to each click in the Krauss decomposition of that line graph. 
and give each pally uh, the fermions corresponding to its clicks. And um, that will constitute a valid um, free fermion description of the, of the Hamiltonian. So I'll say a little bit more about some caveats to this later. Um, but this is all you actually need. So once, once you have this, there's a, a very straightforward uh, recipe for computing uh, everything you might want in the same sort of way as either the, the XY model or the Thai of honeycomb model. Um, and so not every graph is a line graph of some graph. So that's an important point. Um, and so I'm just going to give an example, which is called the claw. So uh, before I tell you what the claw is, consider a, a path graph, uh, P3, which has three edges. And its line graph is the path graph of one edge fewer, P2. So I'm going to look at the line graph of, of this path graph on the left. Uh, so clearly, or maybe it's not clear, but we can see it. No matter how an edge or edges are added to the interior vertices, we always make a triangle. So um, yeah, no matter how I do this, we always make a triangle. And um, adding an edge to the end of the path only elongates the path. So uh, it is therefore impossible for a line graph to contain a claw. And so a claw is a graph of, uh, it's a complete bipartite graph where one vertex is neighboring to three non-neighboring, mutually non-neighboring vertices. And uh, if you remember, the, the non-integrable example uh, of the Hamiltonian we saw earlier does contain a claw. Um, so this is, this is the example of the Hamiltonian that when we started that discrete dynamical process saturated to something like 63 vertices. Um, and so we see that it violates our theorem because it contains a claw and so therefore cannot be a line graph of some other graph. Um, so yeah, so this Hamiltonian does not uh, satisfy the, 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 the theorem, the criterion of the theorem. Um, so that doesn't mean that it's not integrable in other ways. It just happens to be the case that in the, this particular model isn't. Um, okay, so uh, a kind of more general or like uh, formal way of saying this is that there's actually a forbidden subgraph characterization of line graphs. So uh, if I'm given a graph, um, I know it's a line graph if and only if none of the subsets of its vertices induce one of these nine forbidden subgraphs. So when I say induce, I mean I, I look at the collection of its vertices and I consider only those vertices and the edges between them. Uh, so no edges to anything external. And so if um, a graph contains any one of these nine uh, as an induced subgraph, uh, then, then it can't be a line graph. And so these nine anti-commutation structures, uh, you could say, obstruct the kind of free fermion solutions that we're looking at um, because, uh, yeah, so they just obstruct the, the line graph property of a frustration graph. Um, and so then uh, some other sort of curious things about, the exist, uh, about this uh, theorem come from what are called isomorphism theorems. And so uh, for one, uh, there's the Whitney isomorphism theorem, which says that uh, every line graph has a unique root graph except for one, and it's the triangle. So this, this complete graph K3 uh, is both the line graph of itself and also of a claw. So uh, yeah, maybe it's simple to see that this is, that both of these graphs, when I take the line graph, give me back uh, the click K3. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's one uh, kind of interesting isomorphism theorem. Another one uh, is from Young, which says that if two connected graphs uh, have, are edge isomorphic and have more than four vertices, then there is also a vertex isomorphism which induces that edge isomorphism, and that is a unique vertex isomorphism. So yeah, if I have two graphs for which I can preserve their edge incidence relationships by permuting the edges, then that uh, permutation is generated or induced by a, a vertex permutation. And so this is an example of a, an exception to this theorem um, where, and we'll see exactly which edges we need to switch, but you can switch to edges um, on the root graph, uh, which are not induced by any vertex permutation on the root graph. 
Um, and yeah, so, so these algorithms have been used uh, to give a dynamical algorithm to recognize line graphs in linear time. And uh, there are previously uh, known earlier algorithms which are non-dynamical, uh, non but uh, still perform this recognition efficiently. So if you see a, a or if you're given a Pali Hamiltonian and you want to know if there's a generator to generator mapping that tells you if it's a free from beyond one, uh, it's very easy to just recognize just by looking at it basically. Uh, you can just run it through this line graph algorithm. Um, so one implication of the, the first theorem that I said is that uh, a single qubit does not have a unique free fermionization. And this is actually the only uh, time that this happens. So um, if I look at a, a frustration graph for a single qubit Hamiltonian, it's, uh, it can be fermionized by either giving every spin or every uh, Pali operator a, a pair of Majoranas that is uh, some subset of size two of a, of a set of three Majorana modes, or um, I give everybody a common mode, gamma three, and, uh, and then everybody also a unique mode. So uh, in this case, Z gets gamma one, Y gets gamma naught, and X gets gamma two. Um, and so this mapping on the right, we call it the even mapping. Uh, since gamma doesn't participate, uh, we sort of have a get, uh, an, an extra symmetry, which is the we call the parity symmetry. And that's the product of all uh, four Majorana modes, as we saw with the, the Kataev honeycomb model mapping solution. Um, right. And then, as I said, line graphs can be recognized efficiently uh, from the, from the uh, isomorphism theorems I said earlier. Um, and then a third implication uh, of these isomorphism theorems is that, um, that if I am given a spin model and I am given a Clifford symmetry which preserves uh, the symmetries of the spin model, so suppose I'm given a, a Clifford operator that preserves the symmetries of the plaquettes, uh, commutes with all the plaquette operators, then that Clifford is also a symmetry of the single particle Hamiltonian, except uh, when the frustration graph is one of these three line graphs on the right, uh, which is a line graph of one of these three root graphs on the left. So, uh, yeah, so, so this, uh, the edges which are labeled, sorry, the edges which are labeled on the root graphs and the vertices which are labeled on the line graphs are uh, structures which you can switch, um, which are not induced by any vertex isomorphism on the root graph. So I can switch this sort of interior edge to this triangle and this dangling edge uh, off the side, and that will preserve the, the edge incidences. So that will actually preserve the line graph, but there's no vertex permutation that does this. Um, so you can actually find explicit examples of, um, of Hamiltonians with Clifford symmetries that are not uh, free fermion themselves, not free fermion symmetries themselves, but you know, they realize these graphs, uh, but nevertheless, are symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Um, so right, so, so that's everything about clicks and fermions. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, another sort of important detail about these models, which are called cycle, what I call cycle symmetries or cycle stabilizers. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, a cycle is this degree two closed graph. Um, and so what we're doing when we look for symmetries of the Hamiltonian, uh, one, one very important set of symmetries that we're interested in are what, are called, what I'm going to call graphical symmetries. So these are symmetries that I can sort of learn just by looking at the frustration graph of the model. Um, and so uh, these are naturally products of Hamiltonian terms that commute universally with the Hamiltonian, just like these, these plaquette operators commute with every single term in the Hamiltonian. Um, and so uh, these, these symmetries are graphical structures. And it turns out that for these line graph models, you can only have uh, three different kinds. So the first is twin vertices. Uh, the second, as we saw, is cycles. And then the third is uh, the fermionic parity operator, which we saw with the single qubit example. And um, you need to solve the free fermion model over each mutual eigenspace um, of the uh, of the symmetries, um, sometimes you will have a model that when you embed into a free fermion model actually has, uh, say, like a non-trivial parity operator when the parity operator in the spin picture was trivial. So you have to project down um, 
your free fermion solution onto a fixed parity subspace as well. So twin vertices are vertices which have the same neighbors in the anti-compatibility graph. Um, so if they have the same neighbors, then their product meets with everything in the Hamiltonian, and we can remove them by fixing their products, which are stabilizers. Um, so here's an example of a graph. Uh, it's not a line graph. It's actually one of the forbidden subgraphs that I uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, we can notice that it has two twin vertices, which are these labeled vertices in red. And uh, their product, so here's, here's, by the way, a labeling um, that realizes this frustration graph in terms of qubits. And so uh, when I fix the product of these two operators uh, to an eigenvalue, um, I get uh, a graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say this one of these twin vertices is this stabilizer, which is I'm fixing to a particular eigensector. And uh, then I say it's that thing times the other twin. And uh, when I do that, um, I can remove that vertex and add its amplitude to the other vertex. And now this is a line graph. Um, so uh, yeah, so what we see is that um, it's possible to remove uh, these twin vertices. And you can also use that to remove forbidden subgraphs. And this can only be done for pairs of terms um, in general, because uh, if I have more than two terms that are maybe linearly dependent multiplied to a constraint, um, I can only replace them by stabilizer equivalences, which don't give me anything, uh, don't give me anything less than what I had before. So I can't necessarily remove vertices if I have that. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it's possible to potentially remove some of these forbidden subgraphs uh, if they contain twins. And in fact, three of these uh, forbidden subgraphs actually contain twin vertices, the claw, this one I just showed, and this is actually a click missing an edge. So this is a K5 graph without one edge. Um, and so they all have pairs of twin vertices. And once we remove them, they're no longer forbidden subgraphs. And so if it turns out that uh, every, if it turns out that um, when I wire these, these forbidden subgraphs into the global graph, the, the labeled vertices in red remain twins, uh, then these subgraphs can be removed and the, and the Hamiltonian can be solved. And actually, so there's an example of this in the literature. Um, this Lieb Schultz Mathis paper, I believe it's the uh, Ising Heisenberg ferromagnet. Um, yeah, so you have to uh, restrict to the twin vertex symmetries in order to realize that this model has a free fermion solution. Um, okay, so the next set of symmetries I want to talk about are uh, cycles and parity symmetries, the other two classes. And so, uh, these symmetries are going to uh, show up as um, elements of the kernel of the adjacency matrix mod two. So uh, this is what it means to find a subset of, of Hamiltonian terms that when I take their product commute with everything in the Hamiltonian, that's sort of the graph theoretic way of saying that. And um, what we're going to use is the fact that the adjacency matrix of a line graph factorizes mod two uh, into its root graph incidence matrix. So the incidence matrix of a graph is a matrix, it's a binary matrix uh, whose, uh, in, in my convention, the uh, rows are indexed by edges and the columns are indexed by vertices. And uh, so it's simple to verify that this product um, gives you the, the condition for uh, vertices in the line graph to be neighboring um, if I take this, this uh, mod two product. Um, so using that factorization, and as I said before, uh, graphical symmetries are vectors in the kernel of the adjacency matrix mod two. Um, so according to that factorization, there's two cases of uh, an element in the kernel of A. So either it's in the kernel of B transpose itself, or under the action of B transpose, um, the vector is mapped to something in the kernel of B. Uh, so the only elements in the kernel of B transpose are subgraphs of A of, or sorry, are subgraphs of the root graph of even degree, which are cycles, um, or disjoint products of cycles, actually. Um, and uh, vectors which are mapped under B transpose to the kernel of B. So the kernel of B is the all ones vector. Um, 
And uh, that is uh, what we will call the fermionic parity operator. It's the vector whose, uh, which is mapped under B transpose to the all ones vector. Um, so this, this corresponds to a combinatorial structure called the T join, uh, which always exists if uh, the number of vertices in the root graph is even. Um, and a T join is simply a collection of edges uh, such that every vertex has odd degree uh, in this collection of edges. Um, so we naturally sort of associate this to the fermionic parity operator. And then the last sort of detail we need to sweep up in these mappings is the sign of the, uh, the mapping, the image uh, of the pally under the free fermion, uh, under the free fermion mapping. So, so the only thing that I required was that the pallies um, have the correct commutation relations with each other, but uh, I'm still free to exchange the indices uh, in the image of a pally. So I'm still free to exchange gamma J1, gamma J2, and this just gives me a sign. And so how do I know that I faithfully reproduced uh, the properties of the Hamiltonian if I don't fix that sign? Um, so you can also think about this sign as an orientation on the root graph, uh, because like I can just imagine a, a fiducial orientation and just ask, like I give a fiducial ordering to the vertices and I just ask, uh, you know, how does the ordering of my operator or the sign of my operator compare to the fiducial one? Um, so it turns out that we actually fix this orientation already. Sorry, we choose this orientation already when we fix the cycle symmetry eigenvalues. Um, so what we need to do is we first need to choose a spanning tree of the root graph. Um, so this is just a set of edges, a subset of the edges of the root graph, which contains no cycles. Um, and we are free to orient the edges on this tree arbitrarily um, because all orientations on this tree are sort of their, uh, their anti-symmetric uh, single particle Hamiltonians are orthogonally equivalent. So uh, no matter how I orient the edges on this tree, I can always um, think about that as a sign redefinition on the individual Majorana modes themselves. So there's, there's, uh, it's just a single part, it's just a single particle change of basis. Um, and so this can't change the spectrum of H, but it does change the eigenvectors of H by that single particle change of basis. And it's simply a sign or a sign or a handedness convention uh, when you choose the orientation of the edges of this tree. So then the only thing you're really able to do is fix the edges not in the spanning tree. And oops, sorry. Um, and so what we need to do is choose the orientation of the edges not in this tree according to the sign of the independent cycle. Uh, so like we fix the symmetries in the cycles and uh, each of these cycles corresponds to one edge not in the spanning tree or each of the independent cycles does. And um, whatever the eigenvalue of that cycle operator that we're fixing, we just choose that orientation uh, to correspond to that eigenvalue. And so this guarantees that no matter how I multiply um, Pali terms around cycles in my original spin model, uh, the corresponding multiplication of uh, free fermion terms is going to give me the same sign. Okay, so to put all of that together, uh, if you're given a general Pali Hamiltonian, you first check if it's anti, uh, the anti compatibility or frustration graph is a line graph, possibly by removing twin symmetries. Um, if it's a line graph, you can find the graphical symmetries um, and restrict to a fixed eigenspace. Um, for each symmetry eigenvalue configuration, you have to choose an orientation of the, of the corresponding free fermion Hamiltonian, and then you can just solve it. And uh, occasionally, or you know, if the, um, if the Pali uh, picture um, parity operator, if multiplying um, the Pali's in the, to give you a parity operator actually gives you something which is trivial or equivalent to the cycle symmetries, um, then you have to restrict onto a fixed parity eigenspace in your free fermion picture to remove that extra symmetry from this embedding. Um, and so maybe it's just helpful to look at some examples. Uh, so here's a generalization on aperiodic boundary conditions or like uh, uh, closed boundary conditions of the model I showed earlier. So this is the most general nearest neighbor 1D model. Um, and so this is its frustration graph. Uh, it's, this is its, it's colored according to its click decomposition. Um, so every color is a, is a click in the Krauss decomposition. And then when I take the root graph or I realize that this is the line graph of a graph whose vertices correspond to these clicks. And so the vertices 
in the root graph are correspondingly colored. Um, the red edges are a highlighted spanning tree. So notice that any edge that I add off of this tree creates a cycle. Um, and it turns out that in this model on, on closed boundary conditions, uh, the products of the Pali operators around a cycle always gives you the identity. So you have to fix the symmetries according to that. So um, if the, the symmetry only has one eigenvalue, namely one, if it's just the identity, then um, you, have to, you have to fix the edges not on the spanning tree according to that sign. OK, and so uh, we can revisit the Kataev honeycomb model. So the Kataev honeycomb model, um, if you remember, it's Hamiltonian. All three terms, uh, course, the terms correspond to edges of the interaction graph on a honeycomb lattice. And all three terms around a vertex on the honeycomb lattice anti-commute. And so the frustration graph of this model is actually the Kagome lattice uh, with the click decomposition shown like this, colored black and blue. Um, and this actually turns out to be the line graph of the honeycomb lattice again. So um, you can map uh, the honeycomb model from a spin model back onto a set of free fermions hopping on a, on a honeycomb lattice, which corresponds to people think of this as graphene. Um, and so actually what's happening when you pick conserved bond operators um, is you're actually choosing an orientation of the spanning tree and an orientation of uh, the edges not on the spanning tree as the, uh, the eigenvalues of the bond operators. And strictly speaking, you're, you're, you have more freedom than you need um, because only the edges not on the spanning tree are what matter, and the rest of them are sort of orthogonally equivalent. Um, so there are other examples where this has applications to error correction. Uh, so this is uh, something called the 3D gauge frustrated hex, uh, honeycomb gauge color code. Um, I don't know if honeycomb is actually in there, but uh, so this was introduced at uh, QEC in 2019. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a generalization or a modified version of the gauge color code uh, whose, um, where we sum over the, uh, the hexagonal faces, the cubic cells, and the ball cells. So on all of these cells, there are both X and Z type stabilizers. Um, and you can actually, you know, so all X and Z type stabilizers acting on the same body commute with each other because they all uh, these operators have even many vertices on them. So each of these vertices is a qubit. And um, the, you, you can realize that the faces of this model um, actually anti-commute according to an array of, uh, of 1D chains, which are actually disconnected. So um, the, the blue uh, hexagons, you can see they all touch um, at exactly one vertex to their neighbors. And when they cross the other sort of hexagonal chains going orthogonally, they touch them at, at two or even many sites. Um, and so if you alternate X, Z, X, Z, then you see that they anti-commute along a path. And that's actually the, the frustration graph of just the, of a path, which is a line graph. Uh, so this, this uh, set of Hamiltonian terms is a free fermionic uh, solution as well. Uh, so you can also make up new models using this characterization. So this is one that uh, we came up with called the serpinski hanoi model. Um, and it consists of triangular three qubit terms, uh, X, Y, Z, on the filled cells of a, of a Sierpinski triangle. Um, its frustration graph is a graph called the Hanoi graph, which quantifies the allowed towers of Hanoi transitions. Uh, so states of this, uh, vertices on this graph are states of the towers of Hanoi problem, and they're neighboring if uh, there's an allowed transition between the two of them. Uh, surprisingly, this graph is also a line graph, um, and it's actually the line graph of a subdivision of a Hanoi graph of, of size one smaller. Um, so uh, there are also some gauge qubits in this model, and so we found that uh, the model encodes logical qubits at a constant asymptotic rate of 11 over 18. So that's the, as an ex, uh, a constant number of gauge qubits encoded in this model. You can also uh, add a local field to the model without breaking its solvability. And um, when, you, when you calculate the spectrum according to the, free, the single particle energies given by the free fermion spectrum, uh, you see that there is an excited state degeneracy, which actually approaches zero uh, as you increase the size of the system. And so we, we conjecture that this is actually related to the scale symmetry of the model when you take the infinite limit. Um, so yeah, so, so uh, 
That's sort of the main results of the paper. Uh, this gives you a way to characterize free fermion solutions to spin models. Um, and so now in the, in the last couple of remaining minutes that I have, I'm going to like uh, talk about some ongoing work that uh, is happening at the University of Sydney, which corresponds to the independent sets of frustration graphs. Um, so uh, in this work, we want to answer the question of whether there are free fermion models for which there is no hopping graph. So these are, these are mappings sort of beyond generator to generator mappings. And what I, say, uh, what I mean when I say there's no hopping graph is I mean that even though there's no generator to generator mapping, there's still a unitary which maps the Hamiltonian uh, to a sum of single particle, um, sorry, a sum of uh, single site Z operators. So it's diagonal in that sense. Uh, it's sort of single particle diagonal in that sense, single particle energies lambda J. <clears throat> and so it turns out, yes, there is such a model, or there's at least uh, one model that gives an example. And this is a model introduced by, by Paul Fenley in 2019. Um, and so this is the ZZX or four fermion model. Um, it has ZZX terms on adjacent sites uh, on a 1D chain. And its frustration graph looks like this. And uh, this is not a line graph because this uh, highlighted set of edges is forbidden. And you can just extend this, uh, this graph as long as you want. Um, nevertheless, uh, this Hamiltonian for all values of its coupling coefficients H sub J has a expression in terms of this, uh, this sort of um, single particle uh, uh, diagonalization. And so how do these kinds of mappings work? Well, that's what uh, this work is meant to sort of figure out. Um, and so if you think about the previous set of mappings as sort of being linear, they sort of map generators to generators, I would sort of intuitively think of this set of mappings as corresponding to polynomials. So what do I mean by that? Um, the way to construct these mappings uh, is to construct a set of charges from the independent sets of the graph. So I'm going to take all the independent sets of the graph of a fixed size, uh, call it K, and I'm going to construct, uh, construct a conserved charge uh, for each K given by the sum over all such independent sets of the products of all Hamiltonian terms in the set. So this is this product is a product of commuting Hamiltonian terms, and then I sum over all the commuting Hamiltonian terms, uh, sorry, all the independent sets. Keep in mind that the independent sets themselves, these products may not commute with each other within the sum. So uh, our first lemma that we derived is that if the graph itself is claw free, so line graphs are claw free, but they are not all claw free graphs. If the graph is claw free, then these charges that you define uh, commute with each other. So um, yeah, and also with the Hamiltonian. So as I said in this parentheses here, uh, I define Q0 to be the identity just sort of naturally. And then Q1, you can see is just the Hamiltonian itself. And uh, if the graph is claw free, then all the charges commute with the Hamiltonian or with each other. And as a special case, they commute with the Hamiltonian. Um, so they're conserved and commute with each other. So then what we do, or what you do, is construct a transfer matrix, which is a polynomial, uh, an operator valued polynomial, whose coefficients are powers of u and also uh, multiplied with a charge q sub k. And furthermore, if the graph is not only claw free, but also what's called even whole free, um, then you have this relationship. So the transfer matrix multiplies with itself on minus u to give you a number. So this number is proportional to the identity of this thing on the right. And it's in fact the independence polynomial of the graph. Um, so if you have a claw free, even whole free graph, uh, then this transfer matrix multiplies this way. And so uh, these relationships, these two lemmas are extremely important uh, for the mapping. Um, and so uh, in claw free graphs, um, just to kind of give a sense of how these, these lemmas are proved, um, the symmetric difference between uh, any two independent sets in a claw free graph is always a bipartite degree two graph, which is also a disjoint union of paths and even holes. So um, yeah, so for example, consider two independent sets of the graph that I showed, the, the four fermion model. Um, the blue vertices are one independent set, none of the blue vertices neighbor each other. The red vertices are another independent set, which none of them neighbor each other. and um, Together, their symmetric difference, which is everything, 
uh, induces in the original graph just a path. Uh, and this is actually a general property of, sym of uh, symmetric differences of independent sets in cooperative graphs. Um, so because they're bipartite, uh, this implies that if I take two um, products over independent sets and try to commute them past each other, um, they anti-commute only if the number of edges in this induced graph is odd. So uh, then we can use this to show that in those two lemmas, the, the terms that you might otherwise get that you don't want uh, always cancel uh, to just give you what you want. So, uh, you know, it's a bit hand wavy, but um, that's what we do. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, claw freeness and even hole freeness are sort of necessary conditions for that. Um, so here are the two lemmas again. The graph is claw free, then the, the charges you define this way are commuting. And if it's even hole free, uh, then the, char the products are uh, multiplied to an independence polynomial. And the theorem that we conjecture is that uh, if the frustration graph is both even hole and claw free, then it has a free fermion solution. Uh, so this is satisfied by this uh, four fermion model introduced by Fenley. Um, and by free fermion solution, we mean something of this form. And uh, these u sub j's are these zeros of the independence polynomial, or the square roots of the zeros of the independence polynomial. Um, so that's our theorem. And so using the two lemmas, or the analog of the two lemmas for this particular model, uh, Fenley shows that the transfer matrix that you find factorizes this way. So it factorizes the product of uh, operators which are diagonal on the z basis for single spins. Um, and if you just compare the linear terms, you get the desired result uh, that the h itself, which is the first order term of t, has a diagonalization in terms of just single particle uh, energies. Um, so going back to our original sort of table of forbidden subgraphs, uh, we see that even though all these forbidden subgraphs can prohibit generator to generator mappings to free fermions, um, all of them actually themselves have free spectra if they're not wired into any larger graph. So um, yeah, so the top row has twins. So it, it is a, if it's not a line graph or even whole claw free, then you can remove the twins to give an even whole claw free graph, or sorry, to give a, a, a free fermion solution. And then everything in this green box is even whole and claw free. And so it, it satisfies our conjecture theorem. Um, and indeed, you can numerically check that uh, the, any uh, Hamiltonian satisfying these uh, commutation relations has a free fermion spectrum given by exactly what you expect. Um, and so maybe the main takeaway from this talk is it's not just the fact that things anti-commute, it's, it's actually how they anti-commute that's important. And it's that specific uh, sort of relationship um, that tells you uh, interesting properties like this. Um, so, uh, so that's the entire talk. Uh, what we did is we gave a graph theoretic characterization. We've shown how, the, how graph theory can sort of elegantly capture the nuance of a wide class of free fermion solvable models. Um, as I said, uh, the beyond generator to generator uh, work is ongoing. Uh, so that's an open, some, there are some open problems related to that still. Um, other things we want to do is we want to see if uh, it's possible to uh, add to this translation invariance to get um, uh, even, you know, sort of an even more uh, refined characterization. Um, and then another question is, do local unitary rotations uh, give you something else as well? So if I, if I try to find local unitary rotations and, um, and restrict myself to that, uh, can I remove the forbidden subgraphs either of a line graph or the even whole claw free uh, characterization. And so, as I mentioned before, um, the beyond generator to generator mappings is ongoing work with Sam Elman at the University of Sydney and, and also with Steve Lamia and um, the translation variant free fermion uh, work is, is ongoing with Alicia Kalar. And then the uh, local unitary rotation work is ongoing with Dennis Stigemann. Um, and so, finally, uh, some just more open ended applications that we envision. Uh, is I call this an open question of, is there a general trade-off between connectedness and fermionic entanglement, fermionic entanglement? So um, sort of what we're sort of seeing from this, uh, this work is that uh, as you make the frustration graph of the Hamiltonian more connected, of course, there's details to this, but you generally sort of see that the Hamiltonian gets closer to a free fermion one. Um, line graphs are extremely connected because they have this click decomposition.
Um, and even whole claw free grass are also quite connected. Uh, so it kind of makes you wonder if this is indicative of a more general phenomenon um, relating sort of the, the uh, frustration connectedness to uh, the closeness to a free fermion model. Um, and so different sort of ideas we've had to investigate this have been to look at quantum impurity models, uh, which are models with a bounded number of non-fermionizable terms, um, fitting to the closest free fermion model by an effective theory, or by decomposing a non-free fermion Hamiltonian into a subset of terms, uh, which are individually free fermion, but maybe commute in arbitrary ways. And sort of that subset tells you something about the, what we call the free fermionic rank of a Hamiltonian. Um, so yeah, so, so those are uh, sort of some outlooks of the, of the work. And um, if you are interested, you can look at the paper either on the archive or on quantum. Uh, thanks very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, are there any questions um, from from the audience? Just uh, unmute yourself and um, blurt out your your interruption, and then ask your question. Adrian, um, mm -hmm. you you mentioned that. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the wording, but you were talking about a single qubit and how um, th there was some, like it was unique in, in some way. And I think there, there, are, many, there are many similar results about like, ha ha like in dim dimension two is somehow special mm -hmm. um, and, and we haven't really, I don't really have a good kind of intuitive reason for why that is. Did, did you... Do you get any sort of intuition for why dimension two seems to be special here? I don't, I don't have, well, I'll tell you what my intuition is. So my intuition is that um, at small dimension, there's not a whole lot that can happen. And so all kinds of things start sort of like falling on top of each other. Uh, it's sort of my intuitive explanation for why uh, the, the qubit has a non-unique uh, free fermionization. Um, so that free fermionization is sort of, um, you can think about it as, um, I guess, sort of different representations of, you can think about it as being sort of analogous to an accidental isomorphism between groups. Um, so, so fermions generate special orthogonal groups, and of course, qubit spins generate, uh, or spin Hamiltonians generate unitary groups. Um, so there are lots of accidental Lie algebra isomorphisms at small dimension. Um, so actually, so I haven't actually said what this graph is, this big one that I keep showing all over the place. Um, so this graph is the line graph of a complete graph on six vertices, but it is also uh, the frustration graph of the most general two qubit Hamiltonian you can write down. Um, so what that says is actually that uh, the, the general two qubit Hamiltonian um, has a free fermion description in terms of six fermions. And that's sort of equivalent also to an accidental isomorphism between uh, SU4 and SO or spin six. Um, so that's sort of my intuition for why is that at small dimension, there's lots of accidental sort of like equivalences that happen because there's just not enough room for anything interesting, like, you know, for things to sort of diversify. Right. Okay. So about this about this graph, did you draw that by hand, or did uh, some software choose that arrangement? Uh, oh, so this is a combination of uh, Mathematica, Inkscape, and some adjustments I made by hand. Uh, I see. I see. Um, yeah, because I'm looking at it. And it looks like um, there's like some asymmetries, but that's just kind of because the. It, yeah, I don't know. So there should be some, it should be kind of symmetric, right? Yeah, it is kind of symmetric. Um, so it's what's called a strongly regular graph, I believe. Um, so it has the property, it has graph theory symmetry, which, you know, you can't really look at it and see if it has symmetry. But right. um, so uh, it's, it's regular. So every vertex is the same degree. Um, every pair of neighboring vertices has the same number of common neighbors. So like, yeah, two neighboring vertices all have, say, like, lambda neighbors. I think that's the right 
uh, parameter that people use. Um, and then also every pair of non-neighboring vertices has the same number of common neighbors. Uh, so it has that kind of symmetry. And it turns out that these graphs are very highly symmetric. Um, and if I just want to calculate the spectra of the adjacency matrices of these graphs, it turns out that uh, that spectrum is not only highly degenerate, but only depends on those parameters. So there can be many non-isomorphic strongly regular graphs, but um, their spectrum only depends on the number of, on the regularity, the degree of every vertex, the number of common neighbors to every pair of neighboring vertices, and the number of common neighbors to every pair of non-neighboring vertices. So only those three numbers determine the spectrum. So yeah, this is a very, this is actually a very symmetric graph. Right, right. Do we have any other questions for Adrian? Okay, well, if not, uh, thanks, thanks for the talk, Adrian. Uh, and thanks for the timing, it was perfect. Oh, uh, and you got your, your uh, reference in there. So I guess if anyone wants to learn more, head over to Quantum. And uh, otherwise, we'll hopefully we'll see you around Sydney. Sure, thanks. Great, thanks very much.